as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work on social comparison. Uh, this is this uh, pervasive tendency we have to constantly compare ourselves with other people. And again, this ties right in with the kind of establishment and, and maintenance and kind of updating of this notion of this popularity or social hierarchy, how, how you fit in, how you rank with, with relative to other people. But this is, again, one of those constant social pressures that can be kind of uh, very, very, very much something we struggle against, but it's hard to avoid. But the typical form of social comparison is downward social comparison. So basically, if you want to make yourself feel better, you look for somebody who you think is going to be evaluated in some way as kind of lower on some scale, whatever it is, popularity, you know, looks, intelligence, athletic ability, whatever dimension that you're trying to uh, evaluate yourself on, you will typically find uh, looking down at somebody else to sort of prop yourself up. That's downward social comparison. The other direction is upward social comparison, where you look to somebody who you see as clearly like a very high ranking person on this given dimension. And then that might be a source of inspiration, a role model, these kinds of ideas. So these are kind of pretty intuitive, uh, basic dynamics that take place in the context of social comparison and figuring out how you fit in in the overall social order. And this really is all about these kind of contrast effects. Our brains, again, are constantly looking for these relative differences. We don't really care so much about our absolute status. Uh, absolute status doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's hard to evaluate. Uh, and so really we're all about kind of relative to some other group of people, how do we compare? And we really care about in particular our peer group. And that's, again, what you see in high school, this real clear identification of who is your peer group and how do you fit into that specific group. And there's an official German word for this downward social comparison, schadenfreude, uh, which is basically uh, looking at someone else's kind of uh, negative outcome, something bad happening to somebody else. And that makes you feel good about yourself. It really is just this downward social comparison. Uh, so, uh, of course, the ubiquitous uh, Dilbert uh, cartoon here, uh, having a schadenfreude party, would you like to come? Sure, I don't know what that means, but it sounds fun. Too bad you're not invited, loser. Ooh, okay, so, you know, there it is, uh, creating that downward social comparison dynamic. Another pervasive aspect of uh, social pressure and social ranking is this attempt to manage the impression that you give off. And of course, this is exactly what happens in high school. Everybody's trying to, to kind of prop themselves up and, and make themselves seem better uh, than other people so that they, they rank better overall. And so we really do have this tendency to overemphasize positive aspects and social media has, has gained a lot of attention in this respect as a, as a way that a lot of people can kind of create these very carefully manicured kind of uh, curated uh, impressions online that may not really actually reflect what, what your real life is like, but uh, it creates this kind of high standard. And then of course, now everybody's comparing themselves against these high standards that everybody else has established. And it becomes harder to engage in that all important downward social comparison. Uh, and so this creates uh, an overall tendency for greater self-esteem challenges associated with people uh, looking and consuming at this, this social media, uh, making you not feel as good about yourself in comparison to others. Social media did not invent impression management. It just makes it uh, easier to create these kind of, uh, you know, curated, well, well-designed uh, social impressions. And this leads to one of my favorite phenomena, which is the, sh the spotlight effect and this is kind of a, a, a golden rule gone awry here where everybody assumes that everybody else is kind of, you know, paying attention to, to you and sort of evaluating you because you're constantly evaluating yourself, right? So you're constantly sort of saying, well, how do I compare to everybody else? And so somehow you sort of assume, oh, well, if I'm doing this and everybody else is doing this with respect to you, but in fact, everybody's just doing it with respect to themselves, okay? And so this is really the key point. Uh, it's kind of the true uh, 
in some sense, application of the golden rule here is that everybody actually is uh, mostly concerned about themselves. Okay, so if you are worried about you know sticking out and seeming weird, most of the time people aren't really caring that much about that because they're frankly focused on themselves and how do they fit in. And so you have this very funny situation that everybody's kind of walking around in these little bubbles, these little spotlight bubbles, uh, where they're kind of constantly worried about how everybody's evaluating them. Uh, but mostly it's actually nobody's evaluating anybody else because they're so concerned about their own selves. <laughs> so um, on the other hand, it is true that if you do do something embarrassing, I'm sure people will notice <laughs> and take that opportunity for downward social comparison. And, you know, that's that's kind of these embarrassing moments in life that are inevitable. Um, and one of the classic things is that you will almost certainly remember these events far better than anyone else. A lot of times if you go back and ask people, oh, do you remember this really embarrassing thing? They don't remember it about you. They remember their own embarrassing moments about themselves, but they just, again, it's very asymmetric. They don't really pay that much attention to you. So it's a great thing. If you know this, if you recognize this thing, you can sort of shed a lot of that social pressure, that constant feeling like you are constantly needing to evaluate yourself and worry about yourself. Nobody else cares, right? They're all just worried about the mo their own selves. So you can just be yourself, have relax, have a good time. Yeah, it's great. Uh, <laughs> just don't do anything super embarrassing. Okay, so that's my advice. Okay, so here's another framework that basically is consistent with how we've been talking about the relationship between the self and the social environment. And it's known as the interpersonal situation. And it gives us a, a, a point of departure for understanding personality variables in relation to these kinds of social dynamics that we've been talking about. And as we've seen again and again, there are these two dimensions here, dominance or agency or competence is kind of a, a, a broad brushstroke way of thinking about one of these dimensions. And then the other dimension is kind of, again, this kind of affiliation, warmth, uh, communion, tendency to engage in, in pro-social kinds of behaviors. We can organize uh, people along these uh, two axes. In this case, uh, the vertical axis here is this kind of uh, dominance, agency, competence kind of dimension. Um, and then the, uh, the horizontal axis is that uh, affiliation warmth kind of axis. So you have here a very uh, kind of positive person who has warm interpersonal interactions, laughs at themselves, but is very kind of confident and, and kind of dominant and, you know, a high ranking person, so to speak. Um, if you're really kind of into yourself and super uber whatever alpha person, um, but maybe you're not so warm, you're not such a great person to actually interact with, uh, that may be the peak of this kind of, you know, really high in this dominance dimension, but not so high in the warmth dimension. Um, you have this kind of uh, stereotype here of uh, uh, women who are more uh, high in general on this affiliation warmth uh, dimension uh, there. Uh, and then of course, if you get down into these more negative aspects of the dimension, you have people who are low in competence, low in dominance, um, and then you know maybe not so high in, in warmth. So here you have you know high warmth, sort of a pitiable person, versus now over here this kind of really negative quadrant of like antisocial and not very kind of you know dominant or high ranking or or popular, etc. Um, here you have somebody who's extremely antisocial, never forget to be angry. So again, you can kind of see these different dimensions play out, uh, in different personality types. And then those personality types, when they, when those, when people get together, have these really interesting kind of, uh, dynamics. You can see if you have two really strong people who want to be dominant, you get into this kind of pissing competition, right? You know, everybody's kind of trying to outrank the other person and that just becomes tiresome, right? All these kinds of different dynamics of, of how two people will interact can be understood in the context of the playing out of these different dimensions over time. And this is very closely related to the, the Susan Fisk uh, an analysis of stereotypes that we talked about earlier in the context of high school. Here's um, some of the original data 
And this is just really an attempt statistically to try to pick out these underlying dimensions for social stereotypes that have been identified. And you can kind of plot people uh, in different places on these axes here. And they're, they're kind of rotated relative to this axis. So now the horizontal axis here is this kind of competence or dominance, uh, popularity, whatever kind of dimension that is. Um, and then warmth uh, on the vertical axis here. So these stereotypes have these different things like rich people um, are not very considered very warm, but are considered high in the competence dimension. Homeless people on the other axis down here, uh, neither warm nor competent, et cetera. So one last thing before we go to there is thinking again about uh, how we kind of understand our own self in the context of social dynamics, and this is goes under the name of kind of explanatory style and locus of control constructs, how you attribute, again, normally kind of more negative outcomes, whether you blame the situation, you blame other people, you have some external factors that you're using to understand negative outcomes, as opposed to, you know, yourself. And uh, internal locus of control you're kind of more focused on, oh yeah, that was my bad, uh, versus external locus control, you're kind of blaming other people. And there's this construct of learned helplessness, which has been really interesting. It's something that you can actually study in animals. And if you give animals like rats, for example, an uncontrollable shock, uh, they will learn that they don't have control over these kind of important events in their environment. And that actually generalizes to other situations where they do have control and it gives rise to this kind of more depressive kind of uh oh woe is me kind of i can't do anything kind of lack of control type of behavior pro profile as opposed to somebody who really feels like they are in control and can do things about their situation and so that uh is something that that the environment is very much you know important for shaping your your prior history of experience is going to give rise to a lot of these things, but then it, it has effects as you approach new situations and a lot of cultural issues having to do with, you know, behavior patterns for people who uh, have less control over their actual environment, uh, aren't as wealthy, uh, have fewer resources, have all these kinds of problems. Um, those do create important feedback loops and, and people very reasonably adopt a, an interpretation that they don't have that much control over their lives. Um, and that has really important consequences uh, compared to people who have grown up with privilege and have had all these uh, resources and ability to control outcomes. So there really are these important feedback loops shaping how we understand kind of our ability to influence our environment and how that feeds back and understanding uh, you know, how we interpret future events.